Statistics Learning Centre presents Understanding the Normal Distribution. Hi, I'm Dr Nick, and in this video I'm going to explain what the normal distribution is and why it is so amazingly useful. I will also give some examples of finding probabilities in a normal distribution. This video follows on from Distribution's three probability distribution models. All random variables have distributions. When we think of probability distributions, we tend to think of the normal distribution, which is the most well known. The normal distribution is really good for modelling many natural processes, manufacturing processes and human endeavours. You have probably seen its bell shape many times. The normal distribution has the following characteristics. Single peak. Most data values occur near the mean, so that there is a single peak in the middle. Symmetry. Half of the data values measured occur above the mean, and half occur below the mean, so that the distribution is symmetric. Tapers. The further you get from the mean, the fewer people or things occur, so the distribution tapers out in both directions. Caused by multiple factors. Whenever there are many different factors affecting an outcome, we tend to get something that is well modelled by a normal distribution. For example, if we look at the size of an apple, that is affected by the sunshine, wind and rain on every day of its life, also its genetics, pollination date, fertiliser and all sorts of other things. So the distribution of the sizes of apples of the same variety would probably resemble a normal distribution. Each normal distribution is defined by the mean and the standard deviation. The mean is also the median and tells us the midpoint of the distribution. It is the value around which all the data values are centred. The standard deviation tells us about how spread out the data is. A useful rule of thumb is that most, or 95% of the data values, will occur within two standard deviations of the mean. It is important to note that there are also many things that are not well modelled by the normal distribution. Many distributions are not symmetric and have considerable skew, often to the right. House prices, incomes and human weights are not well modelled with the normal distribution as there can be quite a long tail to the right. Even test scores in school are not always well modelled by a normal distribution. But... When you add together many occurrences from even non-normal distributions, you tend to get a normal distribution pretty quickly. Here is an example of what I mean. This is the distribution of number of ice creams purchased per customer at Luke's ice cream stand. It is based on data he has collected over the last few weeks. It is clearly nothing like a normal distribution. We run a simulation of a thousand customers and see what the distribution looks like. It is similar to the original, as we would expect. What say we want to look at what 1,000 lots of two customers buy? Or 1,000 lots of three customers? Or four customers? Or ten? We see that the shape of the graph starts to look more and more like a normal distribution. For 10 customers to order a total of 30 or more ice creams, they would all need to order about three ice creams each, which is pretty unlikely. Similarly, it is pretty unlikely that all 10 people will order just one ice cream for a total of 10. Most of the time, the values will be much less extreme. So, even though the distribution for each individual customer is nothing like the normal, once we add even 10 customers together, the resultant distribution closely resembles the normal distribution. That is why the normal distribution is so useful. We have looked at the bell-shaped graph a lot in this video, and now I'm going to explain how it works. That bell-shaped graph is called the PDF, or Probability Density Function. To find the probability that an outcome is within a certain range, we look at the area under the graph within that range. We could think of it as the probability that a randomly chosen pixel occurs within that range. 
Here is the PDF of a normal distribution approximating the weight of Luke's ice creams. There is a mean of 112 grams and a standard deviation of 9 grams. Straight off, we can say that 95% of all of Luke's ice creams will lie within two standard deviations of the mean. This is always true for normal distributions. So we say that 95%, or most, ice creams weigh between 112 minus 18, which is 94 grams, and 112 plus 18, which is 130 grams. You can see that 95% of the area under the graph is between 94 grams and 130 grams. We can find out the probabilities of other values too. Luke wants to know what proportion of his ice creams are likely to weigh less than 100 grams. So we want to find the probability that x is less than 100, which is represented by the area under the graph to the left of the line going up from the number 100. We can use a calculator, a spreadsheet or tables and find the value 0.091. You can see that 0.091 or 9% of the area is to the left of the number 100. We would expect 9% of ice creams to weigh less than 100 grams. You might want to know how likely it is that an ice cream weighs exactly 120 grams. Strictly speaking, the answer is zero, as the probability of any exact value is zero in a continuous distribution. This is because there are infinitely many ice cream weights between, say, 119.9 and 120.1. So the probability of any specific value is 1 over infinity, which is zero. For example, an ice cream could weigh 120 grams or 120.000001 grams. But our scales are only accurate to the nearest gram. So they will read 120 grams for any ice cream weighing between 119.5 grams and 120.5 grams. We can find the probability of an ice cream weight being in that interval. And the answer to that is 0.03. Practically speaking, 3% of the ice creams will be measured as weighing 120 grams. This video was brought to you by Statistics Learning Centre. Visit our website for more resources to help you learn.